The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Last time, we talked about the photoelectric effect. <clears throat> What was that? And what were the important points? Yes? Like it's quantized and has energy associated with its frequency? Yes. OK. So the, the idea of quantization of, of electromagnetic radiation in photons. And the photon has an energy, h times nu. Nu is the frequency. and. Uh, the evidence was mostly from a plot of what versus what. Somebody else. Yes. Frequency of using the photon versus, or that's on the x-axis, so uh, kinetic energy of the ejected electron versus frequency. Exactly. And and the the slope of that plot which was H, is universal. It doesn't matter where the electron came from. And this was really uh, an amazing thing. And then the other thing we talked about was Compton scattering. And what did Compton scattering tell us? Yes. Photon has momentum. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, we're all we're we're interested in the particle-like character of what we think of as waves, and we we saw that the waves were particles and particles, or at least packets, and these packets had definite momentum, and uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, observation. So today, this is the menu of what I'm going to talk about. And at the end, there's the magic word spectra. And I like that because what we're going to be discovering today is that the internal structure of atoms and molecules, we are not allowed to observe it directly, but it's surprising. And it's encoded in something which we can observe, which is a spectrum. And the spectrum that I will show you at the end is one that is, contains essentially no information, but acts, a temp, acts as a template for what we really want to know about how things are different from hydrogen atom. And that's the beginning of our, our uh, exploration of the structure of atoms and molecules. It's through the spectrum, and it's how it's different from, in subtle ways, the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. OK, so we're going to turn our focus today to the electron as opposed to light. And we're going to play the same game. We know the electron is a particle. Does anyone want to tell me why we know that? Is there any, anybody who's got a clue? You can, oh, good, yes. Yes, I love that experiment. That's the Millikan experiment, and uh, uh, and one of the reasons I love it is because Millikan and Mulliken are two different people, and it's, it's so I find that it's really easy to come up with one of them. And I remember Mulliken is a spectroscopist, and Millikan was an, uh, uh, a different kind of physicist. And, but they're both uh, famous, and they both have connections to uh, important universities. University of Chicago for Millikan and uh, Mulliken, MIT, and Caltech. OK. So we're, we're, we're going to be uh, looking at something that we know is a particle. And we're going to show that it has wave characteristics. And, and so, um, 
we want to be able to show that the electron has a wavelength uh, and it follows the same equation that we used to describe the behavior of uh, electromagnetic radiation. So how would we control the momentum of an electron? Yes. So you can control the kinetic energy that it has by putting it through a certain potential. Okay, so we know, we know we can easily measure the momentum of a particle. That's not a big challenge. And, uh, but then how would we measure its wavelength? Yes. Yes. Uh, we basically use some uh, material which acts as a ruler where we have a, a thin metal foil and the distances between atoms in the foil are constant and and so that's the ruler against which we measure the wavelength of light and so we'll talk about the geiger mars the the, the davison germer experiment uh where we uh measure the wavelength, and then we'll talk about the Geiger-Marsden experiment where we say, well, atoms have electrons in them, and uh, uh, what is the structure of an atom? Remember, we can't look inside, so we have to use some kind of an experiment to be able to look inside the atom. Now, physicists are very, have one trick they often use and that to find out the internal structure of something they shoot a particle or a wave at it that has a wavelength comparable to the distances you're hoping to measure and so if you have a very high energy uh, probe particle it will have a very short wavelength and it will look sort of like a bullet and we know how bullets scatter off of targets or hit targets. And we also, if we choose the wavelength to be comparable to the distances we're expecting to measure, then we're going to see diffraction. This is a kind of subject that lends itself to exam questions. Okay. So let's start out by talking about the Geiger Marsden experiment, I mean the Davison-Germer experiment. So we have a beam of x-rays and um, or a beam of electrons, either one, and we have a, a aluminum foil and we have, since it's an intense beam, um, we want to stop most of it before it hits a detector. And so this is some kind of a screen or And so what we're looking for is when the uh, x-rays or the electrons scatter off of this ruler we get something that appears on the screen as pairs of circles. These are, this is the powder pattern because this is a multi-crystalline subject, object, but in each object we have a bunch of equally spaced atoms, where this is the lattice constant, and this is the square root of two times the lattice constant. So each atom has nearest neighbors and second nearest neighbors. And so we have two rulers going on, and one ruler will give one set of rings, and the other ruler will give a different set of rings, and because these particles are randomly oriented, instead of having spots, 
you have circles. And there's all sorts of information in these powder patterns, but basically they're, they're saying, well, we're seeing a structure which is related to something we know. How would we know the distance between atoms in a, in a foil using macroscopic measurements? Yes, you're hot today. You have access to density and you have access to the non-atomic weight. That's it, yes. So it's a, it's a simple matter to know at least what is the magnitude of the distance. There's, there's an issue of what is the uh, crystal structure and there are different structures and that will give rise to different features in the powder pattern. But the important thing is we do this, we, we look at the uh, pattern that emerges when uh, we shoot x-rays at this screen we already know that X-rays have wavelengths, and so and we can uh, and we know that they have momentum, and because we uh, we uh, we we know about the scattering of uh, uh, photons, and as a result, we we know that we can predict exactly what the uh, the pattern associated with the X-ray scattering is going to be. And then we do the same thing with electrons. And now for the electrons, we can control the momentum. That's easy. And what we want to know is what is the wavelength. And we have the wavelength of the X-rays. And so what we do is we vary the momentum of the uh, uh, electrons until the powder pattern for the electron, the uh, diffraction pattern for the electron is exactly the same as the diffraction pattern for the X-ray. And we discover that for the electron, we have the same result. Okay, so we have now photons, they have wavelengths uh, and momenta. The momentum was the surprise for the photons. And we have particles which have wavelengths and momentum. And the wavelength was a surprise for the particle. So it doesn't matter. Everything follows this equation. And this equation was uh, anticipated by uh, De Bruyne, who in his PhD thesis, you know, he's a person about your age, and he wrote a, his thesis in uh, 1924. And among other brilliant things, he said that everything should follow this simple equation. And uh, um, that was a brave statement. And it, it, uh, it predicted that De Bruyne was going to make a lot of brilliant statements in his career. And this was just the first of, and one of the nicest, but we'll hear a little bit more about De Bruyne by the time I'm finished with this lecture. Okay. So, we're now worried about atoms. And we already know that atoms have a uh, diameter roughly we know that from the density, the typical size. We like to have quantities that describe microscopic objects which are not like 10 to the minus 20 but like one to a hundred. And, and so the angstrom unit, which is a, a 10 to the minus 10 meters, is a very useful thing for talking about sizes of atoms and molecules. Okay, so if we have an atom of a size about one angstrom, we can use this equation to say, well, 
uh, what would it take for an electron to fit inside an atom? So we specify this, we know this, we know that, and that determines what the momentum would have to be. And these are all simple calculations. Um, and uh, uh, since I don't like doing calculations on the board and I don't really need to do this now, you need to be able to do them quickly if I ask you on the exam. But basically, what we end up finding out is that the velocity of the electron would have to be uh, 7.25 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is okay. It's pretty fast. It's a few percent of the speed of light. But that would correspond to a kinetic energy, which is uh, um, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 7 joules. Remember, I don't like these kinds of units. But it also corresponds to uh, doing a unit conversion, 149 electron volts. Electron volts are a good unit for energy for atoms because uh, the ionization energy, the energy it takes to pull an electron off of an atom is always somewhere between 5 and 15 electron volts. So you always want to calibrate yourself, your insight, in terms of numbers which are in the small scale rather than having to remember the exponent. Okay, all right, 149 electron volts. Should that bother you? Well, it can't bother you yet because you don't know about how, what the ionization energy is, but I just told you. It's between 5 and 15. This is a factor of 10 too big. So this is going to be a problem. Why, how is it possible for things so small to have an electron fitting in that small size without it just leaving because it's just way too high energy. And so that leads us to, say, to ask questions about, well, what is the internal structure of an atom? How can an atom somehow accommodate this electron which needs to somehow fit inside? And so that was the basis for the Geiger-Marsden experiment. Now, the Geiger-Marsden experiment looks very similar to the uh, uh, the previous experiment. And here we have whoops, alpha particles. Alpha particles are helium-2 plus ions. And they're produced by radioactive decay. And they have a tremendous amount of energy. More energy than was possible in the days these experiments were doing to create for a, a particle. In fact, one of the earliest uh, uh, experiments or apparatuses capable of producing very high energy electrons was built by Robert Van de Graaff here at MIT. And this was, this was in the form of uh, uh, cylindrical towers right near the parking garage and it was there for the first 10 years I was at MIT. I'm very old but that's still fairly recent. But anyway, Van de Graaff could make high energy particles and it was really neat. And what he could do was dwarfed by what, what can be done in electron accelerators now. But uh, in the days when uh, the uh, the Geiger-Marsden experiment was done, which was 1911, uh, there was no way of making and controlling the energy of uh, an electron or of any particle. And here we have some, some particles which are produced by radioactive decay, which have tremendous energy. So they're heavy and they have high energy. And so that means 
the wavelength is very small. We want to use these helium ions. Yes? Uh, could you not also control the energy of these particles by passing them through? Yes, but, but you would need a very high uh, voltage. And though that, that, that is something we could imagine doing now, but in 1911, the ability to do those, that sort of thing with control was not, not there. There, there needed to be advances in vacuum technology. There needed to be uh, advances in power supplies. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, very high voltages. Uh, and you wouldn't want to do that in your laboratory, e even now with the capability. I remember when I was a graduate student, we had these things called Spellman power supplies. And they could produce 40 kilovolts. They were really scary, but that's nothing compared to what you need. OK, so we want bullets. We want to have these helium particles uh, interacting with a, uh, uh, a thin metal foil. And so we have a whole array of atoms here. And we have a little hole here. And what's going to happen is this radiation is going to hit these atoms. And there's going to be backscatter and forward scattering. And the crucial uh, experiment was to measure the ratio of backscattering to forward scattering. Now, if we have a target that, that looks sort of like a schmear, then the forward and backward scattering would be similar. If we have a target that looked like a bunch of tiny points, there would very rarely be backscattering. All of the scattering would be forward, because most of the particles don't hit anything. And so what was found, and what was a surprise, is that there was very little backscattering. And that implied that the ratio of the size of the target to the size of the particle was enormous. The particles that scattered the, uh, uh, the alpha particles were tiny. They had a size something like 10 to the minus 4 times the typical dimension of an atom. So this is jellium. And this is a perfectly reasonable approach that, uh, that, that the, char the positive and negative charges that make up an atom are distributed uniformly. This was the surprise. So how do we explain now if atoms that are scattering the alpha particles are really small even compared to the one angstrom? Well, how do they stick together? Why is material matter not compressible? So what is going on here? And so now I'm not exactly sure of the genealogy here, but Geiger and Marsden were workers or students in the Rutherford lab. And the old man wanted to save face or to say, oh, here's an experiment. We learned something from this. You know, this is what we do. This is my job. But anyway, so Rutherford said, well, maybe it's like this. We have a nucleus and we have the electrons. OK, so we have a, a nucleus where all the positive charge in the atom and most of the mass resides. And we have electrons in circular orbits. So maybe these circular orbits explain why you can't uh, compress 
atoms to something that would be commensurate with the size of the nuclei. That the, the electrons cause a repulsion and the structure is stable. So this is a, a pretty reasonable hypothesis until one analyzes it. So what we have is a positive charge here, negative charge here. And so there's Coulomb attraction and there's centrifugal force or centripetal acceleration. And we have to have these two things uh, match. So the inward force is minus the charge on the electron squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 and 1 over r squared. And the centrifugal is uh, its um, Okay, this is, you know, you know all this. You know how to do this. Have known it since high school, probably. And so you can combine all these things, say the inward and outward, the inward force is exactly canceling the outward force, and you can solve for the uh, velocity. And the velocity is Q of the electron squared over 4 pi epsilon zero mass of the electron and the radius of the orbit square root. This is a trivial derivation. I won't insult you by attempting to do it and try to in increase your uh, understanding of the equation because you already understand it. So this is the requirement for the radius of a circular uh, orbit and it has the mass uh, I mean, this is the, uh, the requirement for the velocity, and this is the radius here. Okay, so we know all that. And so there's nothing about quantization yet. We know that for any radius, the electron will have a certain velocity. And we can choose whatever radius we want, whatever velocity we want, and that corresponds to whatever energy we get. Okay. So, what we're interested in is the, uh, the frequency of the orbit. The, and so that will be 1 over the time it takes for the electron to go around. And the, 1 over the, the time it takes for the electron to go around is 2 pi r, the circumference, divided by the velocity. So we have the velocity is equal to I mean, the frequency is equal to 1 over 2 pi r. And we can, we can write an equation for this. And uh, that's in the notes. And there, in fact, there was a typo in the notes, which has been corrected in red. But I don't need to, to tell you what it is. And, and so um, we we can calculate this frequency. And what, well, the reason we calculate the frequency is because we know if we have electrons moving back and forth at some frequency, they're going to radiate electromagnetic radiation at that frequency. Well, where did that energy come from? It came from the motion of the electron. So it has to give up uh, kinetic energy. Now, the energy is the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And so if it gives up energy, uh, the sum of these two things has to decrease. And what happens is this decreases faster than this increases. And what ends up happening is that the electron uh, has a death spiral. Uh, what happens will be that the electron will go uh, in a, a, a spiral going faster and faster as it goes to smaller and smaller uh, radius. 
and annihilate itself. So this is garbage. This can't be true. It violates laws that everybody knows are right. And so one needs to find a way to live with this. Now, one really doesn't need to find a way to live with it until you realize what happens. Because this picture, subject to a couple of hypotheses, predicts an infinite number of 10-digit numbers. You know, it's not an accident. Maybe one prediction would be fine, but the, all of the lines in the spectra of hydrogen atom, helium ion, lithium doubly charged ion, all of those are predicted with no adjustable parameters to measurement accuracy. It, now, at the time this was being done, the measurement accuracy might have been only a, a part in a, a, a thousand or, or maybe a part in a million. But a part in 10 to the 10th, we're starting to, beyond that, we're starting to get into fundamental physics. But this is an astonishing thing. And so I have to explain what the additional assumptions were because we've got something that predicts things we have no business knowing. And had, there was no explanation for the spectrum before these experiments uh, or this picture was developed. So we have to first find a way, whether it's b uh, believable or not, of getting rid of the radiative collapse. So Bohr proposed that Angular momentum L, a vector R cross P, is conserved. Well, we know that angular momentum is conserved. But for a microscopic system, what it means to be conserved may be a little bit more subtle. He proposed that angular momentum is conserved and that the angular momentum, the magnitude of the angular momentum, had to have a particular value. And that value was integer times h bar. h bar is the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Now this is complete nonsense. Why should it be conserved? So or why should it be restricted to this set of values? Well, the reason we accept that it's restricted is because it gives the energy levels that are observed. Now, before I get to energy level, well, I do, okay, we have energy levels. We find that the energy is equal to uh, minus some constant over n squared. Same n is in here. This is the Rydberg constant. And uh, it's something that you can measure. It, it's basically a, a whole bunch of fundamental constants combined. And so it has a value. And This is one of the numbers in my permanent memory. And that's the value of the Rydberg constant in reciprocal centimeter units. Uh, and to get it into energy units, you multiply by h times c. Or to get into frequency, you just multiply by the speed of light. So anyway, this is a number that is known to many de decimal places. And uh, it is generated by this uh, th this idea that the angular momentum has to be certain values. Conservation is good. That's easy. This is weird. And uh, uh, it's also wrong because we find out later that the possible values of n include zero. Uh, 
which would completely mess up the, the Bohr model. But anyway, um, this then, in combination with this amazing statement that, okay, we have the nth energy and the n prime energy, and the spectrum corresponds to uh, the frequency corresponds to h um, e n minus e n prime over h. So everything we see in the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom or in a gas where, which is mostly H2, there are transitions associated with the free atoms and they're always around. And this simple equation based on the Rydberg equation, this says the spectra are telling us about the energy level differences. And this is a simple equation. And it's true. It's true to incredibly high accuracy. And it tells you nothing except the mass of the particle. Because the mass of the particle, for this Rydberg equation, we have it expressed in terms of the mass of the electron. But it really should be the reduced mass of the uh, mass of the nucleus times the mass of the electron over the mass of the nucleus plus the mass of the electron. And this is something we know for all two-body interactions. That was known well before the time of these experiments. If you have two things uh, uh, interacting, the reduced mass is what you want rather than the individual masses. And so the only information in these one electron spectra is the mass of the, ad of the nucleus. And there's not much difference in the mass uh, uh, in this reduced mass effect, but it's enough to say this is a spectrum of hydrogen as opposed to lithium 2 plus. Okay, but we still have a problem, a very serious problem. Why is the angular momentum conserved? Why is the angular momentum forced to have a certain value? Well, I've really finished this lecture pretty fast, but uh, so um, let me just. Uh, well, let's just get to the end and then we'll go back. All right, so <clears throat> the problem is this electron is assumed to be a particle and it's assumed to be moving. So the equation of the, uh, uh, Maxwell's equations, all of the equations about motion of, uh, of charged particles say if it's moving, it's going to radiate, or if it's oscillating, it's going to radiate. So maybe the problem is it's not moving. It, remember, the particles are both particles and waves. And so we could imagine that around this circular orbit, we have standing waves, no motion. And so, uh, and this led to the Schrodinger equation, which talks about the states of uh, the electron that are allowed. And it's a wave equation. It's basically the classical wave equation with a couple little twists. And the thing about waves, you remember, we can have constructive and destructive interference. We can have standing waves. So there doesn't need to be a motion of a particle. There could be some static description of the probability of finding the electron everywhere 
around this orbit. And that's the Schrodinger equation. And so in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the classical wave equations, which will be the warm-up for the Schrodinger equations. And the Schrodinger equation explains everything. People have made some really fantastic philosophical statements about the Schrodinger equation. It contains everything that we need to know. The problem is we can't solve the equation exactly. But it's true. And it's, it, it, it contains everything that we'd ever want to know about the microscopic structure of atoms and molecules. So we've been led by these very simple experiments, which now you could do really trivially. You wouldn't have to be a smart student of a smart advisor or a stupid advisor. You would, you would be able to do these experiments and you could yeah, say, yeah, this is all very weird, but we already know, now we know that spectra are everything. And I'm a spectroscopist. I'm very proud of this because the idea that you can make a few measurements and say something about the internal structure of an atom or molecule, that's a fantastic thing. And what we've seen, the spectrum of one electron atoms, is something which is really simple. It's the template for understanding all complexity, because everything is different from hydrogen. Hydrogen has a point charge at the center. It's not quite a point charge, and that's actually uh, a subject of uh, even modern physics. Um, and other atoms are not a point charge because they have electrons. And so there's a concentration of charge. It, the, the thing to which the electron is attached is space filling. And so that re results in a shift of the energy levels. And the shift of the energy levels and how that shift depends on the orbital angular momentum tells you something about the shape of this charge distribution, the radial shape. And, and so everything we do in spectroscopy is somehow referenced to something we understand perfectly, but which is not of much interest. But it's a template for building up our understanding of everything. And this is a kind of a radical statement. And I get to say this because I'm, I'm up here I'm, uh, and, and I do this for a living. I mean, not teaching, but uh, research. And I really believe that uh, the, the things that we are enabled to observe about the microscopic structure of things are encoded in something completely unlike looking at it. And our job is to figure out how to break that code. And that's what I've done for the last 50 years. And it's fun. OK, so what more can I say to amuse you for five or six minutes? Not much, because I've skipped a lot of really great stuff. But go back to De Bruyne. De Bruyne had the hypothesis that there is an integer number of wavelengths around the circular orbit. And that was telling you that it's stable because if it weren't an integer number of wavelengths, the electron would self-annihilate. But that, uh, that takes a valid point and moves it into something which is a little bit wrong because uh, we're not trying to have a particle moving. We're having a distribution of probabilities. And there are still uh, wavelengths and nodal structures. And the stable st solutions do involve the particle not self-annihilating. And so de Broglie scores another triple. I mean, he didn't come up with the Schrodinger equation. So that's the home run that, that says, OK, we, are, we have the, uh, the material now to explain everything. So 
I'm now going to, uh, the next lecture will be just introducing the mathematics of the wave equation and the crucial ideas, and that will lead into the following lecture where we all talk about the Schrodinger equation. So I can stop now. Thanks. <laughs>